Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts Broadcast today. We are pleased to have tech expert Brian Friedlander here to talk about tech solutions for remote learning. Before we get started, let me note a couple of housekeeping items. Those of you tuned into the live webinar may download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you are interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you receive around an hour after the live broadcast. For those of you listening in replay or podcast mode, please visit the webinar replay page on the Attitude website, www.attitudemag.com forward slash podcast hyphen 326 forward slash for access to both the accompanying slides and the certificate of attendance option. So for many students with ADHD and learning disabilities, the same frustrating tech challenges are emerging that they experienced back in March. It continues to be tough for students to navigate online learning platforms and the demands of digital classrooms. In this webinar, students, teachers, and parents will learn about the most effective accommodations and tech tools to support students with ADHD and learning disabilities as they make the most of a weird new school year. We have Brian Friedlander here, as I said. Brian is an Associate Professor of Education at the College of St. Elizabeth in Morristown, New Jersey, where he coordinates graduate programs in special education and teaches graduate courses in assistive technology. Brian consults to many school districts in the state of New Jersey and has taught thousands of educators how to utilize the tools and methodologies of mind mapping to improve learning in the classroom. He is co-author of Engaging the Resistant Child Through Computers and author of several laminated reference guides. You can ask questions to Brian during his presentation and we will try to get to as many of them as we can after he finishes. That all being said, I'll turn it over now to Brian. Thanks so much for being here today. Thanks. Thanks everyone for taking time out of your day to spend some time with me. So, uh, during the course of uh, this webinar, um, I'm going to pose some things for th some things for you to consider when you think about your, your child or your student uh, in the remote um, sessions. Talk about some different tools that could be helpful. Uh, certainly, strategies. It's not always about the tools. It's really a combination of the tools and strategies that make a difference. And talk a little bit about uh, implementation um, practices. So it's kind of interesting. I've been doing um, most of almost all my work now uh, virtual. I teach at St. Elizabeth University. We became a university uh, July 1st. So I teach all my undergrad and graduate courses using Zoom. I'm, I do Zoom webinars. And one of the things that um, I experience is how exhausting it is. And if we looked at the research, and that link at the bottom is an article about the research, um, there's a couple of reasons why. There's a cognitive load when we're doing virtual learning, whether it be in Google Meet or Zoom. One of the things that students find is that they're, they're spending a lot of extra time processing nonverbal cues. A lot of what we pick up on when with other students is or the people is these nonverbal cues, and they're a lot more challenging in this environment. And it consumes a lot of their energy as they're kind of scanning and looking at their their you know their friends' faces or what they're saying. The other thing too is a lot of students are feeling um, a lot more anxious in their remote workspaces. And the other thing, which is really interesting, and sometimes I you know I, I know that. As a faculty member, I, I want my students to keep the camera on, but looking at your own face can be stressful, so the research says. So sometimes it may be a good thing for the students to turn off their video when they're in their session, as, you know, and maybe you know need to speak to the teacher about that. The other thing, too, is that a lot of times students have difficulty uh, interpreting the silence, whether 
um, it, you know, the class is just silent or whether the technology, you know, has failed them. So there's that constant, is it working? Are people hearing me? And so a lot of these factors really speak to cognitive load. And that's why it can be very exhausting uh, doing, spending a lot of time in distance learning. So just a, a couple of a couple of tips. Um, certainly taking frequent physical breaks between sessions and timing them and maybe speaking to teachers about that could be really important. I found also that if you can, having an extra monitor uh, attached to your laptop or your computer can be very helpful for, you know, seeing the presentation on one screen and having a note-taking tool on the other, or even knowing how to split the screen, whether you're on a Surface Pro, a Windows computer, or a Mac, so that you have a split screen for, um, you know, student seeing the presentation and then another screen where the student could be uh, taking notes. Certainly try to limit distractions um, is it, important, and I know it's challenging with having other kids in the home and parents work but we can try to do the best we can. The other, the other tip, which I'll say is important, is especially as teachers are maybe going through a slide deck, is teaching, um, teaching the student or your child how to take a screenshot on a Mac or a PC or a Chromebook can be really important so it can capture the information and they can go back and review it. The other thing, too, is trying to kind of keep organized with meeting links and appointment times. And just the strategy, since a lot of schools um, are using uh, Google Classroom or they're using, you know, Microsoft Office, I mean, certainly tying the meetings with the links into a calendar can be really helpful um, for allowing the students to get access to the meetings. And if, if your students are using Google Classroom, uh, generally, the teachers can um, publish the link to the Google Meet right within Google Classroom. So if you're looking for looking for that link, it should be right in the classroom. And the other thing, too, is working with your kids, teaching them how to search for help when they get stuck. And usually um, a good place for help if you get stuck is going to YouTube and checking out a, a quick tutorial. So the other, the other important tip would be for parents, teachers, and students to understand the learning management platform, whether it's Google Classroom, Microsoft Teams, many of these platforms have um, they've developed their own YouTube videos so that you can get a better understanding of how to navigate through them, which is really um, important. And most of these systems have their own calendar system so that students can see when assignments are due. And I'll show a slide of that in a little bit. Also, um, something that could be really helpful, especially for students with, um, you know, attention and executive function disorder is using a task manager. So something, again, if you're really tied into the Google platform, Google Keep is a really fantastic tool for keeping um, doing reminders, tasks, and even for a, a research tool as well. And it's available on just about any platform. So it can be used on an iPhone or Chromebook, Mac, PC platform. It doesn't really make a difference. If you're into the Microsoft ecosystem, you can use uh, Microsoft Lists, which is another great tool. And of course, um, it's a good practice is, you know, in the morning is to review the plan for the day um, and get all the necessary supplies and books ready. And some students do well using um, setting goals and or timers uh, to stay on task. So those are a couple of quick tips. So it, this is um, a screenshot of uh, Google Classroom. And so if you if the student logs into their class, um, they will actually get to see the calendar. And in the calendar, they will see the assignments that are due. So there should never be uh, a reason why your students don't um, have access to this. So they go to the class, they go to calendar, and they can see when things are due. In addition, um, Google Classroom um, also has the um, 
the feature where, again, if your school turns it on, um, it will automatically send uh, a parent or guardian um, what work has been handed in and what hasn't. So you can keep abreast of where your child or student is at. So you may want to talk to the IT at the school to see if that feature can be turned on for you. So staying focused, um, there are a lot of um, online timers. Um, if you just Google, you know, timers in uh, in Google, uh, you get a, you can have a number of them. Uh, again, depending upon your child or student, there may be some that capture their imagination. But setting setting timers for realistic periods of time can be helpful to help them. Uh, keep focus. It's certainly, you know, when I was in practice as a uh, psychologist, we would often use timers uh, as a way to help students stay focused. So there's lots of some really good timers that are available that you can use for free online. Of course, if you have uh, physical timers, that can be used as well. But kind of more inclined as students are using more remote learning to have these timers available up on the computer. So I had talked a little bit about it, but Using two monitors can make a really big difference. Um, so you can see on the on the left hand side um, the monitor. You have your Zoom session, and on the right hand side you have a PowerPoint. But yeah, basically, you can put monitors into what's called an extended display mode. So basically, it thinks it's one large screen, and all you can once you set it up. Um, you can basically drag whatever applications you are um, from one screen to the other. Um, and so this can be really helpful. And just imagine that you're in a Zoom session on one monitor and on the other monitor, you could have your Google Doc up for notes or Microsoft Word or whatever, whatever note taking tools you want to use. So this can be really handy and um, as opposed to having to sort of navigate on one one screen. Um, so if you, and it, there are some monitors now that are fairly um, inexpensive, under a hundred dollars, they don't have to be top of the line. Um, and they can basically uh, be driven from a Chromebook um, or from a, a Mac or a, or a PC. So one of the, certainly one of the issues for students um, with attentional or um, learning disabilities is how do, they're accessing text. The reading is text on the screen all day long. How are they going to, how are they going to manage that? So certainly using um, text to speech and text to speech is a really Im empowering tool for students because it allows them to access the text independently. Uh, Text-to-speech is generated um, by the computer. Um, so uh, again, depending upon the speech engine, it may be a little robotic, less robotic. It all depends on uh, the system you're on, but there are some really good text-to-speech engines on some of these tools um, for pretty good reading um, experience. So whether your student is in um, Google Classroom um, or they're in Microsoft Teams, uh, they can certainly use the um, text-to-speech. If you're in the Microsoft platform, Microsoft has done an incredible job of adding something called the Immersive Reader, and they have uh, basically added Immersive Reader to just about every application. Uh, if you use their browser Microsoft Edge, which is the latest browser in Windows 10. It has the text-to-speech built into the browser itself, so students can go to any website and right-click, you know, select some text, right-click, and it will start reading. In Google Chrome, uh, things like Snap and Read um, or even uh, Speak It or Read and Write for Google Docs has a really good text-to-speech engine. So it would allow them to read directions uh, in an assignment in Google Classroom or read information on, on the web. As I mentioned, Immersive Reader is embe embedded uh, in Microsoft Edge as well as Microsoft Word and PowerPoint. And it provides a number of of features, not only text-to-speech, but it provides um, picture supports. It also um, provides uh, the, the ability to um, change what the text looks like in terms of colors and background. So it's a really fantastic um, a fantastic application. 
If you're looking for something that's not on the computer and your child needs support for reading, the C-Pen Reader is a personal um, scanner. Um, so you can take a worksheet or a, or a book or a textbook and basically scan over the text and it will read the text uh, to you in, in a high quality text to speech engine. Not only can the C-Pen Reader be used for reading, but if you plug it into a Mac or a PC or a Chromebook with the USB cable provided, students can scan text um, into Google Docs. So I have a lot of students, especially at the high school, college level, that want to take notes. So they basically plug the C-Pen reader into their computer, and then they can basically scan notes from the textbook into their word processor of choice, and then using the text-to-speech, they can have it read back to them. So it makes for a really nice um, solution. Certainly, if you, if for students that have a learning disability, dyslexia, uh, giving them access to audiobooks is really, um, is really important. Um, they can access them from Learning Ally, which provides human-narrated audiobooks, um, or Bookshare, which uses text-to-speech, um, or from your public library, um, the service is called Libby, it formerly Overdrive, and you can take out audiobooks from your public and municipal libraries. I think it's really important that um, we help students to understand that they can read with their ears instead of their eyes. Um, the research shows that there's no difference in terms of comprehension uh, when students do this. Um, I've worked with some very bright dyslexic students um, who have been very successful in college uh, in, in, in large part due to the fact that they access text-to-speech and audio books. If you have a chance Go on YouTube and take a look at um, some of the um, uh, some of the videos about Learning Ally and Bookshare and Libby to get a better idea of what they can do to help your students. But giving them access to these tools is really important, and it's also important when you think about transition planning. Um, because these are the these are the tools that are, are going to make your students or children more independent uh, when they move from high school um, to college. So these are really important to put into the hands of your children and students um, prior to getting to college. You want to give them that experience um, using the tools and figuring them out and, you know, allowing them to figure out what's the best way for them to use it. Just going to. So producing written material, um, you know, during the time of remote learning, students are being asked to produce some material. Certainly one strategy that um, I employ and a lot of special educators employ is using mind mapping software for brainstorming and um, organization. And some of these um Actually, all three are available online. So MindView Online, um, this is an online tool and it allows students to quickly get their ideas down um, you know, on the screen. And this is all through the browser. Um, what's nice is MindView Online also has a citation tool. So for students that are doing research or have to create a bibliography, um, it's built into this particular tool. Um, then you have MindMeister, which is another uh, really fantastic uh, mind mapping uh, tool that's available uh, through the browser. This has some really interesting features. Uh, one of the interesting features for students that may be doing research on a particular topic, it has the ability to, when you put your concept, say you put down the Apollo space program, you can click on a button and it will pull information from the internet about that topic. So it puts it into a note field so students can get um, some basic grounding in the idea or topic ahead of time. And Idea Mapper was is a standalone application, but um, they are beta testing, and you can actually try Idea Mapper um, on a Chrome browser or in the Chrome uh, in a Chromebook or the Chrome browser. Um, what's unique about Idea Mapper is that students get to see their graphic display of their ideas along with an outline. Um, so it's a very powerful writing um, writing tool. And these can be 
kind of used as a pre-writing uh, strategy um, before students open up a word processor, which can be kind of daunting. Some of these also um, have uh, templates to guide students in the writing process, um, so which can be really helpful as well. One of the one of the tools that is is really kind of level the playing field and really change the work that that I do is the whole area of um, voice typing or speech recognition. Um, both um, Apple and Google and Microsoft have done an incredible job of adding automatic speech recognition um, into on through their platforms. In the past, um, if we were using something like Dragon Naturally Speaking, it would take about an hour's worth of training to create what they called a profile for that student's speech pattern, um, which was very daunting because the student had to read for about an hour. And of course, many of the students I work with had reading disabilities, so I would have to sort of whisper the text to them as they read it into the computer. With these technologies, it's automatic. Um, nothing needs to be done. You turn it on and you start speaking. If your speech is fairly clear, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, a lot of these technologies use artificial intelligence and machine learning. So in a sense, they fill in the gaps. Um, for many of you who are on today, if you've used an iPhone or an Android phone and you dictate a text message, um, there will be times when you'll notice that words flip in and words flip out because it, it's beginning to understand the context. So, for example, if you said, I went to the beach today, um, it may initially have put B-E-E-C-H. And then once it figures out that you're talking about the beach, it puts in the word B-E-A-C-H. So using artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, these these tools are becoming much, much more powerful. And many of the students I, that I speak with, um, a lot of them are very bright and they say, I, I have such great ideas and I just can't get them down fast enough because my handwriting is really poor or, or going from the paper, from my ideas to the page is very challenging. So this allows them to do ba basically a brain dump um, with their voice. And it's really easy to use. The voice typing is built into Google Docs. Uh, it's built into the Mac operating system. And if you have Office 365, it's built into Microsoft Word. And the Windows operating system has it built in. Just a quick tip uh, for those of you on Windows, if you press the Windows and the H key, that will bring up the uh, a dialog box for their voice typing that's built in throughout the system. So you can be using that anywhere that you have an open application. So it's really powerful. Um, getting started in, in voice typing is easy. Sometimes the students I work with, they do get hung up because it's not perfect. That's okay. I would start out with um, Having the students, if they have an assignment in Google Docs as an example, if they have to answer a short question um, for an assignment, I would have them start there because um, it, it's going to be much more challenging unless they develop some skills using a mind mapping application to write a research paper. But for a brain dump or for answering questions in one or two sentences, voice typing is a great way, uh, great way to go. As far as grammar checking, um, most of the um, uh, so programs like Grammarly are built into, can be basically installed, built into um, Google Docs. Um, and uh, in, in, on the Windows uh, platform, uh, you can use the uh, Microsoft Editor. It has some really good um, grammar tools. Um, built in. I know a lot of students are using Grammarly. Um, it's fast, efficient, um, and they can try out using the free system, which works really well. Um, and th those you can try out. So if you haven't tried out my mapping software, you can look up these applications and and do a trial and, and see how your students or child likes using it. It can be very graphical because you can use images, um, which is really nice. So one of the other um, issues um, in terms of um, note-taking, uh, students are being asked to do more note-taking um, online. And um, here's a, and, and one of the, uh, I guess one of the recent developments is using audio um, for 
recording uh, um, lessons. And one of the really interesting um, products is Glean from a company called Sonicent. Sonicent um, has a desktop application for Mac and PC and for Android and iPhone. And what it does is that it allows students to see a thumbnail of the teacher's presentation, and then the student records audio um, that is synchronized to that particular slide. And it chunks the audio, it breaks it up. So students can now go to slide one when the teacher is talking about slide one, hit a record button, and then it chunks the audio. It also allows students to what I call tag the audio. So if there's something that's important, they can tag it with a little flag that says important or a flag that says review. Glean is all cloud-based, and so students can access it from just about any device they have, whether it be a Mac, PC, Chromebook or iOS or Android phone. So using audio gives the student the basically the safety net. Um, and they don't have to feel compelled to write every single word down. Glean does give students the ability to type some notes in if they want, but it's not necessary. So take a look at Glean. It's relatively new. The other thing, too, is Glean and um, Audio Note Taker are tools that are being used at the college level. A lot of colleges are no longer providing uh, note takers, and so students are relying on Glean and Audio Note Taker uh, as a way to uh, take notes in, in the classroom. The other trend is through the use of using smart pens or digital pens that can record audio. Um, you see the picture that is a live scribe uh, pen. Uh, the pen can synchronize what's being said with what was written down at that time. Uh, so students, and it allows students to then go back and cue the audio uh, to the time when the teacher was saying um, what they wrote down. So just a, a quick Understanding it's not reading the student's handwriting. It's basically just time stamping what the student wrote down and what the teacher said at that time. And one of the important things about audio is that basically it's minute for minute. And uh, a lot of students I work with, um, and I'm sure your, your children or students, um, you know, it's impossible. There's not enough time to listen to a an hour lecture when you go home. But using either the LiveScribe pen or the Neo Smart Pen, students can basically timestamp what they've, the notes they've taken, and then click on keywords and go back and just review information that they may be lacking. I also recommend that you know, students use something like uh, the Cornell note-taking method with the smart pens so that they basically, if you look that up, you'll see that um, the page is broken up so that there's uh, basically the notes in the right section. Down the left-hand side, there are questions or cues that maybe they didn't understand information. And the bottom part is for summary. So using a digital pen like the LiveScribe pen or Neo Smart Pen is a great way uh, to enhance the this methodology uh, using the Cornell note-taking method. <clears throat> One of the uh, new tools that just came out, which um, I find really uh, intriguing and is interesting, is um, Neo Smart Pen came out with something called the Rico Digital Recorder, and it's a very very um, small device that um, a student would bring into the classroom and it works with their Neo Smart Pen. So the student would put the recorder on their desk or if they're in a remote sec um, session, they can put it on their desk uh, at home. And then using the Neo Smart Pen, they write in their notebook. And um, when they're done, they go back and they can tap on the keywords in the notebook and it will the digital recorder will cue 
queue up what was said at that time. Um, it's a nice solution because it doesn't use the smartphone um, and it's fairly um, inexpensive and it works uh, really well. The Rico Digital Recorder also on a Windows platform uh, can be synchronized with YouTube videos. So if your students are using YouTube videos, it can basically control um, the playhead, uh, which is really, uh, really interesting. Keeping organized, uh, one of the, uh, uh, I guess, key strategies for just about everyone today, but it's got, got a little more complicated with uh, remote learning. So as I, I spoke to you about earlier, um, using something like um, using tasks in Google Calendar um, is a great way to keep keep more organized. And again, it's integrated for those students that are using, um, you know, classroom and, and um, using Google Docs. Everything is integrated. So if you get used to using the calendar, your, st your kids, students will see assignments that are due in their calendar that's connected um, to their, their login. Um, but Google Keep is an again is also synchronized to the student's email account, and it keeps everything synchronized ac across all different platforms. So, um, if you have an iPhone, um, you can load Google the application Google Keep. Uh, you can use it for taking um, photographs. Um, you can use it for setting reminders. Uh, which is really nice. And the equivalent would be Microsoft Lists if you're in the Microsoft ecosystem. But I would highly recommend that students either use Tasks or Google Keep if you're in the, you know, in the Google ecosphere uh, as a way to keep um, organized. Like I said, if they're using uh, the teachers using Google Classroom, uh, they will see all their assignments um, and everything embedded um, in, in that. So one of the other ways that students can keep a little bit more organized is going paperless. And certainly um, it is an interesting movement um, uh, working with students who may have not only organization, but difficult handwriting. Um, over the years, um, I have basically uh, resorted to having either teachers or student, students learning how to scan their worksheets and notes and organizing them on a an iPad or a Chromebook, um, it really doesn't make a difference um, what platform. But if you want to annotate PDFs, um, Read and Write has the Text Help PDF Reader. Um, Don Johnson has Snap and Read. And there's also Kami, which is another application in Chrome. All those work in Chrome um, and allow students to open up PDFs and type right on them. In addition, for students that have reading challenges, as long as the PDFs are procured in an accessible way, um, many all these tools can also, depending upon your, you know, if you have a premium or not, can read the direction. So that's the, the other benefit is that um, if teachers prepare these documents um, in an accessible format, and what I mean by that is PDFs come in different uh, formats. Sometimes it looks like a document to you, but basically it's just an image of the file. When a document is accessible and when we, and what we say is when accessible, it, it has optical character recognition. Imagine that you have the different levels. So you see the image of the file on the screen, but sitting behind it is a Microsoft Word document. And when these tools go to read the documents, they're reading the Word document that's sitting behind the image. So there are tools available that allow documents to be OCR, again, optical character recognition engines that turn the image into a, a text-based document sitting behind it. And that's what uh, would allow these different tools to read it. So if you have a student that not only has a reading challenge, but also maybe dysgraphic, uh, you definitely want to um, take a look and see how you can create accessible um, PDFs that would allow them to annotate um, the, the documents. The other technology that I think we're going to see trending this year are uh, e-ink writing tablets. Um, if you've used a Kindle, um, Amazon has been using the e-ink 
um, screens for many years. Um, they're, they, they, there's generally a lot of them don't have backlit lighting, um, and they're very lightweight and, uh, they basically are used for taking notes, organizing notes, reading, um, PDFs. I've been, um, uh, experimenting with one called paper, P A P Y R. Um, but I'm actually waiting for my remarkable two e ink tablet. And with these, um, these are not, um, these are not like the um, iPads. These are really intended for writing notes that come with a stylus. And they are also great for um, organizing PDFs um, in, a, in a less distracting environment. Many of these do not have browsers, though they have um, Wi-Fi so that you can send your documents um, to yourself or share them with other people. So I think you're going to see a lot of e-ink writing tablets um, trending uh, this year and could be, a, again, a great tool for students that want to be more organized and uh, comes with definitely less, dis, you know, less, less distractions. So when we kind of think about um, looking, um, looking ahead and where this is going, I think um, there's lots of apps, lots of tools that I even spoke about during this um, this session. And, and what I generally say is pick one or two that you think um, has the potential to get bring you the biggest return on investment and just focus on those. It's impossible to do everything um, at once. And when you select those one or two tools, practice using the tools, not in the context of work that has to be done, but uh, really more for kind of mastery in a more playful um, manner um, so that you, you know, your child or your student gets feels more self-confident um, using the tools and can see the benefit of it. Once they've done some practicing, try out the tool during an online class. Set up the class um, and have the tool available and uh, see see how it works. It's really important to you know to have the students um, as they begin to use these tools and and how we how we empower them is to re for them to reflect on what worked, what didn't, how can we fine tune it? And, and that's, you know, that's what I often do with teachers and, and families when selecting assistive technology out of the box. Sometimes it works great. Other times um, you need to look at different tools. So it's important to, once you've picked out one or two tools to refine your tools and strategies and uh, reflect on what worked and what maybe you need to make some uh, changes in. That's me. If you're looking to learn more about these technologies, um, I do consult like to schools, to families, um, and do professional development like I'm doing now. Um, so please feel free to, um, you know, to reach me. And uh, just wondering if there's any, any questions, Wayne? Yeah, lots, lots. Um, some general questions and some very specific ones. So okay. I'll start with the general one. My child has a 504 yeah. and a meeting coming up to discuss accommodations. The proposed accommodations the school sent me are in-person learning oriented, and my child is learning remotely. Can you please go over some possible accommodations for ADHD that could be relevant to online learning? Yeah, I mean, um, certainly, I, I, and I think it's really that's a that's a really great a, a great question. Um, I think is is you know do some of the in class things do they um, do they translate into the remote learning? I mean, so for example, if uh, if the student is you know getting um, support for reading you know reading tests or quizzes. Um, I would say, well, we can certainly provide, let's say, text to speech at home for, you know, uh, for any kind of reading that needs to be done. Or, you know, it may be that the child may need to, some coaching or, monitor, you know, some coaching from a teacher to show them how they can use Google Classroom to uh, and, or Google Calendar to organize tasks or Google Keep. So I would try to see if there's a natural translation to some of the things I spoke about today um, in terms of their equivalency, um, in terms of remote, you know, environment um, and, and see if it, you know, and, and see what tools are available to support the student at home. Okay. Uh, as a middle school counselor, I'm trying to help parents with how to stay focused when they're in front of a device. From your experience, have you 
kind of, do you have any suggestions? I mean, we've had several questions like this. Yeah, I mean, I said, I think, um, you know, I think, you know, definitely setting setting timers can be really um, can be really important. Um, and I think that, you know, for some kids, they may need to, you know, and teachers may need to understand that, you know, maybe their attention span is 10 minutes and they need to get up and do something a little bit physical and then come back. I mean, it's even hard. I mean, it's even hard for adults to sit in front of the screen for you know, hours at a time. So I think it may be important for uh, counselors, uh, parents to talk to teachers about the need for more frequent breaks than they are giving. It's, a, you know, I, I think when you're in the classroom, there's sort of natural break times that are built in. Um, and as I said before, there is a very um, kind of big cognitive load when you're online. So I think, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, certainly teachers need to do that. And teachers can also kind of check in with um, with students uh, to see that they're, you know, that they're actually paying attention. I know a lot, there's a lot of paraprofessionals that are working online and they can certainly kind of help um, and maybe chat with the student or kind of cue them to try to, you know, keep them engaged in online as well. Mm-hmm. Maybe that could be an accommodation of 15, yeah. after 15 minutes. That would be yeah. one maybe. Yeah. Or, you know, again, like I said, have the power professional kind of check in uh, with mm-hmm. the student after 10 minutes, um, to either through chat, which would be private, mm-hmm. um, which can be might be really helpful as well. Yeah. Um, there are, as I said, there are a lot of specific ones, uh, questions as well. How well do the text to speech tools work with math textbooks? Ma- math math's much more um, much more challenging and it would depend on how the text you know if the publisher um, how they prepared the documents there are some um, uh, technologies that uh, where text to speech can work really well but the the text itself has to be um, prepared in a certain way I mean for Basic word problems, text to speech will work okay, but you get into more sophisticated, like, you know, differential equations. Um, it would, you know, the, the publisher would have had to prepare the documents in a certain manner. But I would, um, I would, I would take a look at uh, Read and Write for Google Chrome. Um, they've, they have worked with a number of uh, companies, and uh, you may find some good success with their text to speech engine. Mm-hmm. Several parents have asked, uh, is using multiple monitor screens distracting for students? Have you found that or not? No, because I, I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, I, I personally think it's really helpful because it kind of breaks up and it, you know, I think sometimes kids lose focus because they may be trying to multitask and this one screen it kind of gets in the way. Um, so this way they can kind of focus on the content and take notes, um, you know, uh, as, as well. So I, I think it's definitely, um, I think it's definitely worth trying. And like I said, monitors are not that expensive these days and they don't need a really high end one to do it. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I would, I would certainly, you know, give it, give it a try again with the focus on them not playing games on the other monitor, but having, let's say their Google docs up to take notes or a PowerPoint uh, taking notes, things of that sort. Um, Here's a specific one. How do students access closed caption in zoom? Um, So that's interesting question. Um, (laughs) Right now, they were they were supposed. I, I, I did see somewhere they were supposed to roll it out, but right now it's through um, third parties, eight th- th- third party APIs. So that generally, like I, I just participated in what our state um, eight uh, tax center webinar, and the director there had to basically um, pay a third party to come in and actually. Uh, you know, do the the closed captioning. Um, so I'm I'm hoping that you know Zoom itself will include it as part of the their interface. Right now, it's through third party, or you can also set it up to give someone um, access to the captions, but they'd be typing them. You know, you, you need let's say that power professional or mm-hmm. teacher actually typing it. Um, there is clo- automatic closed captioning that's built into Google Slides. Um, teachers can turn that on. Um, 
And also there is um, closed captioning uh, in my, in PowerPoint um, Office 365. Pa- the one in PowerPoint is very powerful because if you, you know, if you're a teacher and let's say you have, um, let, let's say you have a number of students that uh, English is not their native language, but you have a lot of students who are Portuguese, you could set the language to Portuguese. So you speak English and the captions are in Portuguese. It also will generate a transcript at the end of the session that you could then take an email to the student. There is a web-based captioner that's free. It's called webcaptioner.com. Um, and so um, teachers may, you know, may want to take a look um, at, at that. Um, I suspect Google Classroom will add it. Um, too shortly uh, in that they have it basically embedded in Google Slides, so I'm sure it's um, it's it's on the roadmap um, soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, several questions: Do a lot of these tools work in other languages? Uh, this is a teacher who's saying I have a large number of Spanish-speaking students and parents struggling with reading, writing, and organization. Um, so they want they want. So if they could be more specific, do they want, like, for example, like the the example um, with the PowerPoint, you could be speaking English and the closed captioning can be Spanish. Um, They're also in, um, I know in Microsoft Office 365, um, you can speak, um, you can dictate in Spanish. I'm not sure about that in Chrome. Uh, You know, so those are, I, I know there are some word prediction applications that um, you can work in uh, in Spanish, and and Google has a lot of translation services that are built built in to quickly go from one language to the other. So students can, you know, uh, type in you know type in Spanish and then convert it to English um, if they if they wanted. Um, so that that's possible as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the parents uh, who's attending. Uh, suggest that Equatio, I don't know if you've heard of that, works well for math. That's E-Q-A- Yes. E-Q-U-A-T-I-O. Yes. Equatio um, allows students to use either dictate or type um, their mathematical expressions. And that, re- that again, because it's the way it's prepared, using their text-to-speech, it will read it um, accurately. So if teachers, in a sense, use that um, in their math, classes equatio which is free for teachers by the way it's by the it's by um text help which um publishes um read and write for google chrome it will read math appropriately they also have um uh, they also embed the uh, the desmos um graphical calculator graphing calculator and also um basically a math um virtual workspace as well so again if teachers spend the time uh, it could be a way for them to create uh, various math materials and, uh, and make accommodations for students. And it also allows students to respond using Equatio. So Equatio is free for teachers, but in order to use it uh, with students, students would need to have a subscription or a licensed account. And that's usually something done at the district level. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, one other suggestion, then I'll get on to uh, one parent it says Microsoft Windows 10 has the ability to split the screen, and sometimes that is enough for her student, her child. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Excellent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, several parents have asked about uh, tools for kids uh, kindergarten through third grade. Um, is there anything? Yeah, I mean, in the area in the area of math, there's lots of um, like virtual manipulatives that can be really helpful. It's almost like having physical Cuisinier rods. Um, um, so I think it's math pl- like mathplayground.com. If you do a search, you can find them. So you can use like base ten blocks, um, and they also have some annotating tools. So for kids that need more visual experiences with math. Uh, this is great. They have, um, you know, activities like uh, you know, money, time, um, counting blocks, ten, tangrams, things of that sort. That can be helpful. And also there's a lot of, you know, um, like uh, sites like Epic and Vox that have talking books that can be really helpful. Um, so, I mean, there's lots of those kinds of, uh, you know, multimedia sites that young 
young students can take advantage um, advantage of. Um, and even things like Brain Pop, which are kind of informational videos. A lot of schools um, have subscriptions to these, um, to you know, to the uh, Brain Pop. And these are kind of really interesting, uh, very engaging videos mm-hmm. for younger, younger students. What suggestions do you have for those who are blind, hearing impaired, blind slash low vision? Anything for them? Um, well, I mean, you know, I mean, as far as accessibility, I mean, the, you know, a lot of that's built into the operating system. Are they looking for anything more specifically? I mean, um, no, uh, they didn't, um, I just wondered if these tools had options for people who have auditory processing disorder or anything else that might be. Uh, well, I mean, all the devices have, um, you know, screen um, screen readers built in. So, you know, I mean, Apple has voice over um, the, the Windows has um, their own uh, called narrator and Chrome has, um, you know, has Chrome Vox, you know, built is built in. So if the sites are accessible, all these screen readers should be able to access them without any additional uh, additional software. Um, but again, it's a lot is dependent upon how you know these sites were built and whether, for example, you know uh, all text was used, um, you know when they created um, you know the website, things of that sort. Mm-hmm. Several parents have brought up that their school system doesn't allow them to do the recording on the live scribe, live scribe, and other things. Have you run into that problem? Is that a is it a hit or miss thing, depending on the school yeah, system? Yeah, it depends on the depends on the school system. I've worked with some school systems that you know said, Brian, if you recommend that, you're never coming back here. And then I have some schools that you know um, you know are very supportive of the uh, of the technology. And I think it's on a case by case basis. Um, but there are some districts that you know um, will not allow the students to um, to do that. And I, I think it's really short sighted of them because these are the these the the audio recording tools are going to get better and better. And these are the tools that students are going to rely on, especially when they go off to you know their secondary get a secondary education i mean there are technologies like otter.ai that use the iphone that use artificial intelligence that basically you can put it in a meeting and uh it will transcribe the meeting in real time so these are really important tools for students that may have you know language processing difficulties auditory (laughs) processing difficulties or learning disabilities so i I think it's on a case-by-case basis but i mean i think what better way to practice using this than this time when we're at home um you know again i I think it's important for districts to have policies that so if a student's going to be using it and in those districts where i have used it they had a policy you know that the parents signed off the students signed off with their, their understanding of what you know how they were to use it but i think it's really important um, as part of transition plans to to um, have students learn how to use these various um, audio recording tools um, as an accommodation for their learning. I think it's it's imperative. So I would not. I would. Um, you know. I I would definitely advocate and uh, you know have uh, you know to try it. Like I said, is, is a case by case basis. But I think what better way uh, to learn how to use it now that students are actually home. Mm-hmm. And as long as, you know, another, you know, the, the the objection I get is, well, you know, when the child's in the in the classroom, they may pick up what another kid is saying and then that kid can be identified. Generally, in Zoom sessions, everyone is muted for the most part, except the teacher. So it's a perfect scenario to practice using these tools, um, you know, in a, you know, in a, in a safe in a safe way. Um, and uh, so I think that's, you know, definitely something that needs to be tried. Uh, any tech tools that you know of uh, that are good for building vocabulary? Uh, building vocabulary. Yeah. Um, I mean, the C, the C pen reader has a, has a, you know, dictionary tool um, and also um, read and write for Google Chrome 
has the dictionary tool. There's lots of dictionary.com has, the, you know, there's extensions in Chrome where you can basically load the extension and then like right click on the word and it will read it. Um, there's lots of those. Um, I'm just trying to, this one, oh, I've got the name at the top of my head. Um, there's a really interesting uh, tool. If you Google it, um, basically you type the word in and it builds basically a mind map of words, synonyms and antonyms but it's very visual and a lot of a lot of students really enjoy it um th- there's a commercial one but there's a there's one that's um in like uh public you know in the public domain that you can use that's really interesting so you could put the word like fast and it gives you all kinds of other words that you can use and also microsoft microsoft word has uh you know has uh, great options for um using a yeah like basically a thesaurus so there's lots of options for that uh, are schools required to provide these technologies for a child with an IEP? If they're written, if um, if the child requires it because of their um, their learning uh, disability, yes, they are required. Um, it may not be specifically what you think, but uh, they are required. So, if your child has a reading, let's say dyslexia, um, then and. Um, it's determined that they would benefit from text to speech, then they would be required to provide the application uh, or service so that your stu- that your child or student can gain access uh, to it. That's written in that's written in code. I mean, sometimes you know districts may not want to, but uh, it, it is it is the law. Um, and if you're not sure whether your child would benefit, then you can get a consultation or an assistive tech evaluation as you might request an OT or any other evaluation, um, you know, in your school district. But school districts are definitely um, required to, once they recommend written into an IEP, to provide the hardware, software, or computer for that matter, um, so that the student can um, basically obtain a free and appropriate public education. Uh And there's a sort of an oh my god moment question here. Does Mind View actually cost three hundred forty nine dollars? <laughs> yeah, some of it does. They do have a subscription. I don't know if it's fifteen dollars <laughs> um, a month. Uh, the Mind View online. Some of these some of these tools are um, they're you know they're desktop and they've migrated them so they're a little bit less. Um, and and yeah. so you know for a subscription, yeah. How to introduce how. Can a parent, teacher, slap anybody introduce these tools without overwhelming the student? I think you sort of address that. Try one or two. Yeah, I would try one or two. And, and it, like anything else, I mean, some of the stuff is, you know, you know, all these tools have tremendous features. You know, I'd focus on the most uh, most essential. So, for example, like voice recognition. I mean, um, you can start off by having the student respond to a simple question about, like, you know, what's their favorite food? Um, and but bear in mind that, you know, if you, when you click the button and you, you dictate, that's great. Bear in mind, if you wanted to, you can learn a hundred different commands to, to move the mat, you know, to move the insertion point around the screen. But I don't usually start off with that. So start really simple, figure out what you need, the most important thing that you need to have your child or student accomplish and just focus on that feature that's going to help them you know, to do that. Once you do that, then things will come up and your child may say, well, how do I, you know, how do I move the cursor from the bottom of the page to the top of the page with my voice? Then you can get into that, but don't start with the complex. Start with what's simple and what you need to get done now before delving into the the complexity of the program. Mm -hmm. Two quick ones. I know we're almost at the end. Can CPEN Reader capture teacher's spoken word when the student is listening online, no, it, it's just a, it's just a, it scans text. It's not, it doesn't, um, it's not an audio recorder. Uh huh. For voice typing, how do students do this while in class without disturbing those around them? Um, I mean, when we were physically in class, some kids um, actually would go into the into the hallway. But, you know, the technology has gotten so much better that even with some background noise, it still works pretty well. Um, there's also a company that makes a microphone that actually um, it, it, it deadens the sound. So they, they, they put almost looks like a mask. They put it over their mouth 
and they can actually speak into it. And so it muffles everything. Or it muffles what they're saying and gives them the privacy and allows them to use um, the, the, you know, the, uh, the voice uh, dictation feature. Um, so that's a, another option that runs a solution to about a hundred dollars, but I, I've actually tested it out with some school districts and it works really well because the student can stay in the classroom. Um, the students can't hear what they're saying and it, it really does a nice job. It works well with the technology. Mm-hmm. Well, I think the hour is up. Thanks so much for being here, Brian. It was really that good. Was, that Exciting. was great. Yeah, went quick, insightful and practical. I know a lot of people online here are attending uh, suggested they learned a lot. Good. So, um, I think overall it was a real success. So thank you. Thank you. And thanks once again to all of the attendees for joining us. Thanks for being here today, everyone, and have a great day. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit AttitudeMag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-Mag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-Mag.com.